Okay. Uh, tonight's speaker is Peter Stoll. Um, Peter is a local historian. Uh, he's the author of two books in Arcadia Publishing's Images of America series, uh, one on Dixfield and another one on Old Town. And he's also the administrator for the Images of Oxford County Facebook page, where he generously shares with everybody pictures from his extensive uh, postcard collection. So if you're on Facebook and you're not following that page, uh, you really should be, because he puts a lot of neat stuff up there. Images of Oxford County. Right? Um, so Peter, I believe, first became interested in the Penobscot Nation while he was writing his book on Old Town. And he was able to interact with uh, tribe members who were members of the Penobscot tribe. Uh, tonight's program is a newly revised version of a presentation he's given all over Western Maine. I think I was just asking him before the program, and he said he's given it about 10 times. But uh, tonight's program has, what did you say, about twice as much material as, as some of the previous ones. So it's quite exciting to have Peter with us tonight to uh, give us the program. So, Peter? I have a slideshow for you, and that's the good news, because if I would just stand out front and talk, I could go for 10 hours easily. So this is going to contain me, keep me within some, for, some form of an outline. I first started doing this show in about uh, 2006 for local high schools and historical societies that were interested in some of the Western Maine Indians. And the impetus for starting the show came from a book that came out in 2004 written by Dr. Edward Martin. Rumford, and I'll talk about that book in a, mi in a minute. Uh, and then uh, it just kind of took off from there. And then I found a quote from my great-great-grandmother in a newspaper, and she just talks about her first experience with the Indians. And I'll talk about that too, so I'll get, I'll get right into it. First, I'd like to remember my grandparents, Florence and Harriet Swift and Harry Swift, uh, and they're shown at the Bird's, Bird Hill home. But you're not seeing that. Why aren't you seeing that? Oh, I have to start from the beginning. OK. Isn't that pretty? There we go. Here they are. This is Florence and Harry Swift, my grandparents. And they're, they're at the Bird Hill home about 1,000 feet from here. And uh, I remember my grandmother's donuts and my grandfather's generosity in helping me go to graduate school. So I honor them tonight. And I'd also like to mention uh, to bring the, the energy of the people here tonight to a woman in Manchester, New Hampshire, by the name of Jude Hackala. I've never met her, but she's from Greenwood. And she's experiencing uh, a world of hurt through injuries suffered as a psychiatric nurse from being thoroughly beaten by one of her patients. And uh, she's hanging to life by a golden thread, she says. So everybody send her good cheer. Let's start with a couple books that I'm going to recommend to you. Because if you read one of these books, you'll know a hundred times more than I can present to you tonight. These are wonderful books. Uh, they have main connections. Nancy LeCompte's Al Nobat, which means neighbor, was published by the Androscoggin Historical Society in 2003. It's a wonderful primer on the Indians of Western Maine, especially Androscoggin County, but it does come into Oxford County uh, and, and mentions the Anasagunacooks of Canton. And a, a nice companion to that book is William Haviland's Canoe Indians of Down East Maine. Uh, he was an anthropologist who wanted to study Maine Indians, but people told him he'd starve to death if he did. So he took his uh, career down to Brazil and worked there, but once he retired, he came back to Maine and settled in the Midcoast area and just kind of takes you on a leisurely stroll of the Wawanok Indians down on the coast and piecing together evidence of how they lived, how they did things, how they lived their lives. And it's a wonderful book, just, you, you, it's a spiritual book almost. 
And just two more, Notes on a Lost Flute by Kerry Hardy uh, is also another book where he, he in a similar vein as to uh, the previous one by Haviland. Very nice. And the fourth one I haven't read yet, and I'm a little afraid to because what I've read about it, I, I think it's just going to be powerfully emotional. This is a, Aunt Sarah was a, a Western Abenaki. Western means west of the Great Hills, west of the White Mountains. And at the close of the French and Indian War, she, like her family, like a lot of others, went up to St. Francis in Quebec where they had Indian reservations and lived out their lives. But some of them didn't. Some of them came back. And Sarah's father was one of them that came back to, I think the town was Guildhall, Vermont. I could have that wrong, but it's Guild something. And, and Aunt Sarah tells the story of coming back to Vermont and living her life as a medicine woman. Very, very good. Okay, most of you recognize this picture. I just thought I'd start off with a little scenery from town. This is North Pond, and this is probably the, the, sea, the scene as uh, Sock Alexis Newell would see it in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And it's a way to introduce Indian tribes to you. And we'll start with the Eastern Maine tribes, which you're all familiar with. The Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, and Micmac and Maliseet. They've been there forever, and the reason they've been there forever is that they had the good fortune to exist in the part of Maine that was controlled by the French, which was not a battleground. Western Maine was the battleground. So the tribes that were here are gone, and they include the Narantzwaks. Now, can you tell where they might be from? What town does that sound like? Narantzwak. Norridgewok. This is Norridgewok. The corruption is Norridgewok. But the name of the tribe was Narantzwak. The Sokolkis were on the Saco River, and they were in New Hampshire and in Vermont in northern Massachusetts. But they, they came into Maine quite often and had uh, had a presence in York County and Oxford County. The cannabis Indians, this is where the 15-year-olds laugh. Ha ha ha, cannabis. Not, not spelled quite the same. The cannabis Indians were uh, an umbrella tribe on the Kennebec River. Cannabis, Kennebec. Yes, there's a connection. And then the Amagon Pontooks, you've driven by their, their land hundreds of times, all of you. Uh, they were in New Auburn, right on the Androscoggin River, as you cross over the river into Lewiston to connect with Route 196. Or if you're coming the other way, they, there, you would turn right as soon as you came into New Auburn, and they would be off to your right on Laurel Street. And we've all gone by it many times. And then the Wawanoks. The Wawanoks were, were on the coast of Maine, on the Sheepskit River, the uh, St. George River, and the Damascotta River. And the Pajepsquits, well, we could say Pajepsquits, they were from Topsom and Brunswick. And they were Anasagunacook Indians. Anasagunacook is the, the overall name for all the Indians on the Androscoggin River. <coughs> then we have the Taconics, and the Taconics were from Winslow, and they were a, a, a cannabis tribe. And who was a, oh, there was a very famous Taconic Indian. I'm blocking on his name, sorry about that. And then the Anasagunacooks over in Canton, a very large, fierce, family-oriented tribe of perhaps up to 4,000 people, all wiped out, all gone. Uh, Anasagunacooks will come into my story towards the end, so I've been told, and interrupt me rudely and take over my presentation. I'm looking forward to it. So, and then we had the Rocomicos, and the Rocomico was the tribe that was in Canton. And Dr. Martin, who we referred to earlier, wrote a book about the Rocomicos called Thunder from the Mountains. And then the Pentecooks. The Pentecooks were mostly in New Hampshire, in the Concord, New Hampshire area, but they spilled over into Maine, and towards the end of their existence as a tribe, they moved to Maine. Why? Because the governor of New Hampshire 
refused to protect him from death by the Mohawks. So they abandoned New Hampshire and they came to Maine. They came over to Canton where their chief, Cancomagus, also became chief in Canton. Then the Amasaconte uh, on the Sandy River, at the junction of the Sandy River and the uh, Kennebec River. They were at Farmington Falls, right about where Farmington Falls crosses over into Chesterville? Chesterville. And then the Pequawkets. The Pequawkets were in Freiburg. Freiburg was called Pequawket. So here we now, have, we have 12 tribes in Western Maine. 12, they're all gone, they're all dead. No more tribes, no more federal recognition. They got wiped out and the, and the remnants that didn't get wiped out got absorbed into the various reservations in Canada. Some are still here. We'll get to that. This is my great, great grandmother, Sophronia. You like that name? Her cousin was San Chansonetta. So it's Chansonetta and Sophronia. Very, very mellifluous names. Well, when she was about three or four years old, and I'm guessing this is 1835, she, she said later in life, my father took me to see the Indians. I was frightened as I had heard about their killing children, but these were good Indians. One woman had a little papoose. There were a dozen of them, and one of the men had a violin, and they played and danced for us. Can you imagine a little three or four year old girl being held in her daddy's arms, and he takes her down to the village in Dixfield Center, or Dick, the Dixfield Village, and takes her weeds crossed onto the little islands to see the Indians. And not only does she see a papoose, which puts her at ease, she also hears the music from a violin. And she remembered it, and 85 years later, here she is in 1917, sharing her recollections through the newspaper. And when I saw that, I really became interested in not only my great-great-grandmother, but in Indians. Because this is, we're talking 1835. The Indians had been gone from the area for 50 years or more, but some were still here. Okay, these are some, some of the tribes in New England. And when you see the name Abenaki, it's because they don't have enough room really to break it down into the local tribes. So they just call them all Abenakis. So the ones in Vermont on the left and New Hampshire in the middle are Western Abenakis. And the ones in Maine are the Eastern Abenakis. And then down below you have the Mohicans, Mohicans, Wampanoags, Mohicans, Picots, Narragansett, Niandics, and so forth. Uh, interesting that the Mohicans are related to the Mohicans, but neither of them are related to the Mohicans. There's a quiz. So what was going on in Europe? Let's set, let's set the stage for what was happening in Europe that affected North American Indians in the 16th and 17th century. Actually, there was quite a bit. France was exploring Canada. Champlain had founded Quebec in, 19, in 1608. He'd already been on Mount Desert Island. Jesuit missions followed. The first one was on Mount Desert Island in 1611 by the French. The English kicked him out by 1613, but they came back a few years later. And the Indians were on the Penobscot in 1605. Or the, or the Jesuits were on the Penobscot in 1605. The Maritimes were claimed in 1604 by France, and Castine was named for the French Baron de Castine. So France was here, England was here. Did they get along? Nope. England made forays into Maine, attempting a, a colony at Popham in 1607. It failed, but thousands of fishing and trapping voyages took place before the pilgrims landed in 1620. Maybe as, may, as many as 10,000 of these voyages. We don't hear about this in the history books, but 10,000. You consider all of New England in fishing voyages is probably 20,000. From Spaniards, Portuguese, Basques, French, English, they're all over here. And they had factories on the coasts of Maine where they were salting their, their cod and their halibut and all of that. And they all knew they were there. We, we don't think there were communication systems in place back then. There were communication systems in place back then. Everybody knew everybody's business. To achieve their economic and territorial aims, the French used religion to soothe the Indians. The natives felt valued, most, most converted to Catholicism. France worked within the Indians' culture. 
and this is a, a graphic of uh, confession from the Passamaquoddies, and the Indian is supplicant is saying, no rum, no fire water, he's been good. And it really was a major problem back then, was rum and fire water given by both sides to the Indians to take their land, but primarily the English. The English considered Indians to be savages, using their economic and military might to subdue them. They played the tribes against each other, demanding loyalty to the crown. The English and Spanish sold the Indians into slavery, often to Caribbean sugar plantations. Mistreatment was common. Many were never heard from again, and many died. Both France and England made lots of mistakes, but England made more. In 1498, Sebastian Cabot of England took three Indians from Canada to England with him. And in 1524, Johnny Verrazano captured an Indian boy and took him to France. In 1535, Jacques Cartier, James Cartier, captured the St. Croix Indian chief, Don Acona, and returned to France with him. And the most, one of the most infamous ones. In 1605, George Weymouth captured five Wawanock Indians off Pemaquid and took them to England. His captives were Tisquantum, Manada, Skawaros, Chief Dihanada, and Chief and, and Asakunit. And the reason I give you their names is that they should be remembered. They were plucked off the shores of New England, off Maine, and taken to England. And what you see on the right is an, a memoirs of Ferdinando Georges. Now, how does he come in? Because three of the Indians were given to him. He was an entrepreneur. He was very interested in Maine. Basically, he owned Maine. He owned it. He was the governor of Maine reporting to the king. So you have, we have this publication dated 17, uh, excuse me, 1659, and it's put out by Ferdinando Georges, Gorges. Now this caused a lot of confusion. Indeed, it was put out by Ferdinando Gorges, and it was put out in 1659, but not by the man we're talking about. It was put out by his grandson. The first, his grandfather had died 11 years earlier. But this has caused a lot of confusion in Maine history. When people say Ferdinando Gorges, there were actually three of them. There was the guy that we care about, who was the governor, and he had a brother, John. And John had a son, Ferdinando, and Ferdinando had a son, Ferdinando. So it gets very confusing. And I actually have the family history of the Gorges family and there's probably 80 to 100 listed in a little book that I've got. Half of them named Ferdinando. And the reason is that Ferdinando's wife was a goddaughter of the queen. So that's how he got Maine and New Hampshire, along with Mason. I don't remember Mason's first name. So they made a deal. Mason would take New Hampshire and, and uh, Gorgeous would take Maine. And in 1611, Captain Edward Harlow captured three Maine Indians and three more at Martha's Vineyard. And Harlow and Weymouth both presented them to Sir Fernando, Ferdinando Gorges, an entrepreneur, and to the English Chief Justice, Sir John Popham. And here the graphic is the Wawanocks of the coast shooting arrows into Edward Harlow's boats, trying to convince him to free Epinal and several other of the Indians who were captured. They failed, but they did succeed in capturing a lifeboat from uh, the boat and filling it with sand on the beach so it couldn't be taken away by, by Harlow. Harlow's captives, well, I'm going to choke on these names, so bear with me. Pecandimna, Petchmal, Monopet, Sakaweston, Konakonam, and Ipanau. And again, listing their names so they, you've heard them. They're in your heads. Remember them. They were wronged. And George has kept, kept them for years, finding out all he could about Maine, its flora, its rivers, its harbors, fauna, fauna, natural resources, anything that would make money for him in England. And of course, they were hit in London, where one died. But Popham's nephew, this is John Popham's nephew, George, brought two of them back to America. They piloted, piloted the English along the Maine coast to, far, to form the, in, 
the failed main colony at Popham. Skiwaros and Dihinada were the two brought back to do this, and they were the ones that helped Gorgias. The ill-planned colony failed, and it failed because George Popham, who was in charge of it, really didn't have any his wits about him. He was not a planner, he was not a leader. And although they brought a lot of uh, the right resources to Maine, they didn't bring, they didn't plan very well. And incidentally, the site of the first colony, about a mile from today's Popham Beach, has been discovered. It's been unearthed, and they've uncovered 19 foundation posts of the original building, the storehouse, that measured 60 feet by 29 feet. And I haven't been there, I just found out that fact a couple days ago, so you better believe I'm going. And then here we have the confusion. George's namesake grandson published his memoirs 10 years after his death, confounding historians forever. One historian said that the original Gorgias published his, his papers in, in 1659. Well, he couldn't have, he died 11 years earlier. So, but, and people don't know this, and this is where historians start fighting with each other because they don't, we don't, I'll include myself among them. We don't have all the information in a, in a convenient place, so there I'll be charitable. Now, in 1621, Samoset came into the Pilgrim's Village and he greeted them by saying, welcome Englishman. Imagine that, speaking English. Well, he learned his English from the fishermen. You remember there were 10,000 voyages to me? He later returned with Tisquantum, once captured by Weymouth, but now it's called Squanto. And we all remember Squanto for primary grade history books as the Indian who taught the pilgrims how to plant corn and to use fertilizer to do so. But Squanto's fate was not to be a, a happy one. He uh, had delusions of grandeur, or was perhaps a megalomaniac, and was distrusted by both sides and wound up dying in 1622. Perhaps he was poisoned by his tribe. There was a bounty on his head. They wanted to bring him back and ex execute him for some of the things he did. Or perhaps he was poisoned by the whites. History, history has not decided. Speaking of the Mayflower, I highly recommend this book by Nathaniel Philbrick called The Mayflower. And if you read it, it will change everything you know about the Mayflower. Everything you learned in school will go out the window. Like, they killed the first Indians literally before they landed. Before they ever made it off the boat, they were shooting Indians from shore. It was like, oh. You learn, they don't teach you that in uh, grade school, do they? More mistakes. On the Saco River, in 1675, Englishmen overheard a Secaucus, overturned a Secaucus canoe carrying an infant to see if it could swim like the fishes, because that was the lure among English sailors. They can swim from birth. That was it. Well, he sank and he later died from hypothermia. Minui was his name. Minui, remember that, the little baby that was wantonly tossed overboard into the water and drowned. He was the son of Chief Squando, who became furious and sought revenge. This is 1675, and if you remember when the French and Indian War started, King Philip's War, same year, 1675, so Squando didn't have a long time to wait. King Philip's War broke out when Massasoit's son, King Philip, believed that his brother, Wamsutta, had been killed by the Englishmen but he likely died of natural causes. But it was too late. Before the issue could be ironed out, the dogs of war were loose. Chief Squando joined King Philip, leading deadly raids, raids on many main towns. And then you see a picture of Squando cursing over the skeletons of his white victims. Raids occurred all over New England. Maine suffered badly with many Western tribes joining King Philip. More wars followed over the next 85 years. The tribes suffered too. Diseased battles, raids, and bounties reduced their numbers. Speaking of bounties, I'm jumping ahead maybe 100 years, 80 years. Here's the proclamation by Governor Spencer Phipps of Massachusetts placing a bounty on all Penobscots, men, women, and children. 50 pounds for a male if you brought him in. 50 pounds back then would translate into $150, <clears throat> big bucks. 
and their crime, they wanted to remain neutral in the French and Indian Wars. They wanted to remain neutral, the Penobscots. They wanted to remain neutral. And in, yesterday, I got into my main historical society books, and I said, I wonder if they cover the correspondence between the governor and the, and the tribe about this issue. And they did. There were several letters from the governor to the tribe and several letters from the tribe back to the governor. And the tribe said, we can't join your war unless you can promise us that the men, women, and children that we leave behind will be taken care of, that they'll be fed, that they will be protected. No, we can't guarantee that. We have to fight the war. Well, we would like safe passage then through the woods to join another Indian tribe to take them there. No, we cannot afford the manpower. Well, will you give us safe passage ourselves so that we can take them there? No, we don't have the ability to distinguish between Indians. Any Indian is ripe for, to be shot. So this went on for several months and I have all the letters. I was reading them today and it was like, oh my God, all they wanted was safety. That's what they wanted. And they might have joined the English side, but they couldn't get what they wanted. So they said, no. And so he says, okay, you're all dead. Come to Boston, I will pay for the scalps, I will pay for the live, the live ones. Okay, back, back to the 1690s. <clears throat> Originally there were 15 towns around 1690 in Maine, after the French and Indian Wars started, 1675 up through 1690, there were four towns left, and they were all in York County. The rest had been uh, torched by Indians. Hundreds of Indians were, uh, settlers were captured and taken to Canada. Some were ransomed, some rose to prominence in the Catholic convents, and many stayed up there and they preferred their captivity and never returned. And many were taken to France and some of them returned to the States. I think Ben Conant has a relative. Ben Conant is a historian in uh, South Paris. And he was telling me he had a, a relative who, by the name of Jordan who was taken to France and came back. And of course, you know what his nickname was, Frenchie. Some things never change. And here's some of the names in Coleman. And I tried to pick names. And you could see I didn't get very far into the alphabet. I tried to pick names that you might find familiar in Oxford County or Maine. No Chapmans, no Stoles, no Mills. I guess we weren't in the, in the state yet. And I can't guarantee that all these names refer to Maine people, but they certainly refer to New England people. And they're, they're very common. And the two volume book, New England Captives Carried to Canada, probably lists 1,500 to 2,000 of these captives and what happened to, to them. <clears throat> and in the title, she emphasizes to Canada meaning we have records of who went there, but we're not so sure about who came back because there were many routes to get back. But everybody let the authorities in Massachusetts know who was captured. So that's how the government got the names together so they could declare a truce from time to time and meet with the Commission of Vaudreuil in, in Quebec and say, okay, we'll exchange 100 for 100, okay. And so they'd make all the preparations, and sometimes it could take weeks or months for that exchange to take place. But a lot of the people did come back. Uh, the great grandfather of John Greenleaf Whittier was one of those that was scalped and left for dead in the Portland area, but he survived. Or oh, we wouldn't have John Greenleaf Whittier. And of course, he's famous for the most famous Indian poem ever written called Mog Magon. Meg McGon, something like that. All right, now let's get to the main Indians on the main, on the main rivers in eastern and western Maine. You see the little wandering blue line, that's roughly the dividing line between the French territory to the right and the English territory to the left, but each of them claimed territory on either side of the line. For example, the French had missionaries down in York County in the early 1600s and got away with it, even though the English claimed all that area. And they had, uh, they had missionaries up on the Androscoggin River with the Anasagunda Cooks as well. And you get this information in a book called The Catholic Missions 
Catholic Indian Missions in Maine, another great book. The Passamaquoddy, as you know, they live on the St. Croix River. That's the eastern boundary with Maine with Canada, site of the one of the first French kidnappings. They live on Passamaquoddy Bay in Indian Township in Princeton. And Penobscot River is the home of the Penobscot Indians. There were tribal sites on Indian Island at Old Town, Mattawamkeag, Olamon, Bangor, Kanduskeg, and Pasadumkeg. Now Bangor is interesting. You probably have seen that site if you've driven through Bangor, headed north, when you get to Hogan Road where all the shopping centers are. If you look off to the right, there's a cemetery 1,000, 1,500 feet away up on a hill. That's the Mount Hope Cemetery. That's where the Indians lived, right in there. They were forced out, of course, but they had a village there. And their chiefs included Madaka Wando, who was very highly respected, and he was at a lot of the conferences that the English called to bring all the tribes together. And they did, they talked all the time. It wasn't like they didn't know each other or didn't talk to each other. They did talk to each other a lot, and they knew what each other wanted, and they knew when they'd gone over the line. The problem with the English is they're a hierarchical structure. The orders come down from the top. The Indians have a community structure. They have to agree on things. And when you put those two models together, you know which one is going to win. It's the one that's highly organized. It's always been that way. That's how Caesar defeated the Gauls. They were organized into clans, and Caesar was organized into battalions, top-down command. And this is Princess Watawaso, one of my favorite heroes. She's a direct descendant of Chief Orono, and you can search for her on YouTube and be treated to one of the nicest uh, mezzo-soprano voices you'll ever hear. She recorded for RCA Records back in 1910 to 1918, and you go on YouTube and type in her name and listen to her music. It's beautiful. And when she retired, she, uh, the Depression kind of wiped her out and wiped out vaudeville, and she was part of that Indian Chautauqua circuit. And so she came back to Maine. <coughs> she married a Kayo by the name of Bruce Poolaw, and they opened uh, Poo Chief Poolaw's trading post on Indian Island in Old Town. Maybe some of you have been there. And on the Kennebec River, it was home of the Kennebec, cannabis, or the cannabis Indians, and the tribes are located in Augusta. They were the Kushnucks, Winslow, the Taconics, and Narajwak, the Naranswaks. Balmazin was a noted warrior from this tribe. And on the St. George Damascot on the Sheepskut River, you had the Wawanoks. And they may have been a subtribe of the Penobscots, but others say they were a subtribe of the Anasagunacooks. And I, and I haven't found anything that's the, the ru ruling authority on that. They were peaceful, but they bore the brunt of the English predations. Why? Because they were on the coast. They were easy to snatch. And on the Androscoggin River, you have the Anasagana Cooks, and they roamed the watershed of this river right from the headwaters all the way down to Sabino Island in, off the, the main coast below Bath. And they were divided in the Pajepsquits in Topsom, the Amag Gunpontux in Auburn, Rocamicos in Canton, and the Sabatis tribe in Sabatis. <clears throat> okay, let's take a little side trip to talk about Doc Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin was born in Mexico in 1928. Joseph Edward Martin, he was a hometown boy, he was a Mexico high school grad, class of 45. His diploma always hung in his office. He, joined the community activities, was a community activist, and he loved Acadian and Western Maine Indian history. Well, he died in 2001, and his book published from the mountains was, was published in 2004, and I consider it to be one of the greatest books to come out of Western Maine. Historically accurate and finely detailed, he's crafted a lively novel with the Rock Amico's role in the Wabanaki Alliance. And I use the word Wabanaki here, which means more than one tribe of Abenakis getting together for a common purpose. Then it became Wabanaki. And it's a term that still ex exists today to describe a culture, the Wabanaki culture. Still very much studied today. 
Unfortunately, it's poorly edited and riddled with spelling and grammatical errors. Nonetheless, this engrossing read will tell you so much more about lost Indian tribes than this presentation ever could. It's hard to find locally or online and can be expensive. I just checked today, the lowest, lowest price was $24 and it went up to, I forget, 118 or something like that. They have it books and things in Norway for 30. 30. I have one here for 23, I have an extra. I buy any, any copy I can find below $25, I buy it and sell it for what I paid for. So if anybody wants it. In, in uh, Hebron, I brought three copies and they were gone in 30 seconds. <laughs> there you go, buddy. <laughs> 23 bucks. Uh, okay, now we're down to the Saco River. And we had the Sokokis and Saco, Pequawkets and Freiburg, the Penacooks and Concord, New Hampshire, spilled over into Maine, and the Apequawkis on the Saco River. And their land extended into New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. Now here are some more that, I, that I'm going to tell you about. I, I can't tell you a lot about them, but I will research them as time goes on. Uh, at the Auburn Airport, when they did a construction project there a few years ago, they discovered the Michio site <coughs> and found Paleo-Indian sites, 11, 10 to $11,000. Did the... I'm gonna pass this around. This is a sign-up sheet if you want handouts. Uh, I'll deliver them by email. It's just a whole lot more efficient and they probably run 10 to 12 pages, and uh, absolutely free. And they'll include a lot of what I'm talking about tonight, but not specific slides. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, and then in New Auburn, and we've talked about this, the Amagon Pontooks, and in Danville, there were stone artifacts found in Danville, the thousands of years old. And in Leeds, two things. There was Sabatis had his camp there, and Leeds was, was a, uh, a portage area from the Androscoggin watershed over to the Kennebec River. And that was important. That's how the tribes got together, was through Leeds. As a matter of fact, when a lot of the Indians that stayed after France was kicked out of the New World, they reconvened in Leeds and had Indian settlements there for many, many years. <coughs> And in Lewiston, they found clay works, con fields, and foot trails. And Livermore bands camped in Livermore seasonally. Mechanic Falls, they discovered a foot trail along the Little Androscoggin River. And there was an ancient village in Minot. And when I did this presentation in Hebron a couple months ago, a man came up to me from Minot and said, Peter, I can take you to an Indian burial place a half mile down the road. Oh, I didn't get his name. <laughs> Anyway, Poland Springs, used by Maliaki. And in Poland, there was seasonal camping by uh, Thompson Lake. And they've discovered a, a stone fish weir in uh, Sabatis. And on the, the Nizinska farm, notice how I managed to work the Nizinska farm into this presentation, one of my favorite all-time farms, at the, roughly at the junction of Route 4 and 117, uh, they've discovered an Indian site that was 8,500 year, years old, Paleo-Indians, and they took 326 tools off the site and 4,000 chips from tools. And, and the site is gone now. The reason they, they, they excavated it was that it was, being, it was going to be used for an erosion control project. But once they started, they found all of these artifacts <clears throat> so they stopped the project until they could excavate it and take all this stuff. Okay, and there are more Western Maine Indian bands from Sister Mary Celeste Legere's book, The Catholic Missions in Maine, and other sources. The Amasa County, a village at Farmington Falls. The Cobbesee County, village near Gardner, about four miles from my house, which our local people are trying to rehabilitate. Uh, the Macadacut between the Penobscot and the Kennebec Rivers, the Mosh Moshok Moshokwen on Lower Cumberland County, Ossipee in York County, Pemaquid Village near uh, Pemaquid, and Sabino Village south of Bath, Maine, and the Sabinos were roughly, they had to be the Indians that were on hand 
when the Pauline Colony was started in 1607, because it's right in their backyard. <clears throat> and they had the Sawakataks on the Saco River, the Nowichawanics on the main New Hampshire border, Squamscuts in York County. You guys taking all this down? It's going to be a quiz. The Acamentas in York County and the Anasek, the second tribe on the Sandy River near Farmington. So doubtless there are many more because they've discovered about 2,000 Indian sites here in Maine. 2,000. Now that doesn't mean there are 2,000 tribes, it just means there are 2,000 sites that they can relate back to tribes. And I think I just read recently that the Indian shell heaps that down on the Damascotta River, now I could have this wrong, but I think they were 300 meters long, which is nearly 1,000 feet, 300 meters wide, which is 1,000 feet, by nine feet deep. That's a hell of a lot of clams. <laughs> That just tells you the presence that Indians had in the state when the state was theirs. That's all gone. So with all the deaths from battles, raids, and bounties, and sickness, and infirmities, where did all the main Indian tribes go? Well, in August uh, 1724, with the murder of Durant's Walk's best friend, the French missionary Sebastian Rail, the English uh, rapidly asserted their control of the Kennebec once the informal boundary with France. The remnants of the Narantzawaks went to St. Francis in Canada. And then after their defeat at the Battle of Lovewell Pond in Freiburg in May 1725, the Pequawkets moved to the St. Francis Reserved in Canada. The Sokokas went there too. Canada was always friendly. The decline of the Wawanoks prompted their move to join the Rockamikos in Canton. The Penacooks came over from New Hampshire and joined them as well. And some went east from all of these tribes and joined the Penobscots. The Cannabis, Taconics, and Narantzawaks also moved to Canada, where the French government asked them to join their reserves, first at Sillery near Quebec, then at St. Francis on the Chaudier River, then at St. Francis, then Odenac, both on the St. Francis River, then another one at Wallenac on the Bikankor River. I love the name Wallemak, Wallenac. Wally means good, thank you, welcome, pleasant, all those words. Nak means place, the welcome place, Wallenac. And here's a celebration of the Abenakis at Odenac in Canada in June 2011 at one of their powwows. Maine has lots of powwows, by the way. If you Google powwow online, uh, it's late in the season now, but if you do it in the spring, a dozen or more powwows will always come up that you're welcome to attend. And the state of Maine, down at the Gray Animal Farm, or whatever it's called now, uh, does, I think, two powwows a year. They just had one a couple weeks ago. And the Penobscots have lived in Old Town for 6,000 years maybe 10,000 years. Do you get that? 6,000 to 10,000 years. We've been here 400. 6,000 years is a long time. And 10,000 years, the, the reason they don't know is that excavations take money. There's no money to excavate the portions of Indian Island that are being protected right now just for future excavation. So we will know more as time goes on and the money starts flowing again, if it ever does start flowing again. Okay, this has been a heavy slog. Let's do some, uh, let's do some A words that break Google. You want to have some fun, type in some of these words. And what, what do they call, there's a term for so when you type in a word in Google and one entry comes up and another term for it when no entries come up. Item not found. Well, some of these you're going to get no returns on. And the first one is, is different ways of spelling Abenaki. And we, everyone knows we've settled on the one at the bottom, Abenaki. But all the others were in common use by English and French authorities over the hundreds of years. And you can almost tell who used what by the ending if it's an O-I-S, it's French. If it's a K-I-S, it's Indian. 
if it's a Q-U-I-O-N-E, it's French, and so forth. And then the next one, can anybody guess what that word is supposed to be? It's a river that flows through Bethel, the Androscoggin. And these are all the different names of the Androscoggin River. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, my brother always told me it was the Ogunscoggin River. I believed him. He was wrong. <laughs> and it's one of the few spellings not on here. Which brother was that? Pardon? Which brother was that? Mike. You could have guessed it. <laughs> anyway, so we have the Ambroscoggin, and then you have the Amoscoggin, the Amoroscoggin, and the or Arconacontuk, which may, may refer to the tribe, or the river, or both. We don't know. And then we have the Androscoggin, and you may be tempted to think that the Androscoggin was named for Governor Andros of Massachusetts. No, he was one of the most hated governors in the history of Massachusetts. They would not name a fence post for him. They couldn't wait to get rid of him. <laughs> So the correct spelling is not on there, and I'm so confused now, I'm not sure I could give you the correct spelling. Okay, how would you have, I thought I took this slide out, this is the same thing. I misspelled wood, I misspelled spelt, and I misspelled, oh, there's og and scoggin right there. There it is. That's the one I believe is right. No, okay. Pukwocket, how would you spell Pukwocket? Pick one. Just in your mind, pick one. You all got one? Just focused on one? Okay, next slide is the reveal. Bling! The correct one. Bakwaki. That was the Indian term as first recorded by the French. Bakwaki. And it was first uh, uh, written down in Furlan's History of Canada, a book I can't find and a book which I want. But it was... The spelling in the top line, Pequocket, correct spelling please, that's the way it's traditionally spelled now, in Maine at least. If I were to do this presentation in New Hampshire, everything I said to you tonight would be a lie. They, they, don't, they don't write to history the same way. They just don't, and that's okay. You just don't recognize it. But Maine has kind of evolving towards a little bit of a consensus on what the history was, especially in Eastern Maine, not so much in Western Maine. Why? There are no tribes here. There are Indians here, but there are no tribes here. The political power has been diluted. The grant writing has been diluted. The public me attendance at public meetings like this has been diluted. So let's bring that back. Let's do some of this stuff. Let's organize. Okay, what are tribes anyway? Now I've just talked to you about tribes, and now I'm going to say there are no such thing as tribes, and they really aren't. And I'll tell you why I, I believe that after I read this. Descendants of almost every southern New England tribe, the Penacook, the Narragansetts, Pocomtooks, Nipmucks, can be found among the Abenaki, especially the Sokolke. The Sokolke, the western Abenakis, remember, beyond the, the Great Hills, the White Mountains. Indians commonly gathered in families and clans. Bands knew about each other and lived with each other. Tribes make it easy to talk about, but families rule. In the colonial period, the English were fine with referring to tribes. It worked to track them down and kill them. Tribes worked. It doesn't work when you're talking about people. And I'll give you a couple examples. The, well, one is gonna come out of the slideshow later, but there, uh, let me see, what is it, rhyolite taken from Mount Kineo in Moosehead Lake. It was found all over Maine and all the tribes had it. All the tribes made pilgrimages to Mount Kineo for the rhyolite, for their, for their tools. You had copper in all the tribes that wanted to deal in copper. Where'd they get it? They got it from the Mi'kmaqs in the maritime provinces who mined it and made bracelets and traded. And you had arrowheads in Maine that came from the Susquehanna region of Virginia. Why? They traveled back and forth to trade. Relatives. That's how you, and you, you know, you've got a son down in the, a college in Virginia, you just go down. You buy a trinket and you bring it back. So, and that's what the Indians did. They all knew about each other. They all knew who their friends were. They all knew who their enemies were. They knew where all their relatives were. 
and the relatives were in all of those tribes, and they all were intermarrying. That's like saying uh, the Greenwood tribe. Well, what does that say? The Greenwood tribe. You know there's no such thing as a Greenwood tribe. There isn't. People from here tonight from all different towns, all different places, some are summer people, some come from 50 miles, 100 miles. There's no such thing as a Greenwood tribe. Much the same with Indians. So there really is no such thing as a Pequawket tribe or an Anasagatacook tribe. They were, you kind of can gather them together, but it doesn't work too deeply. So, so I try not to use tribe, except that it works when I'm giving presentations. Okay, but aren't Indians still around today? You bet, in great numbers. Town history are replete with local residents, Maliocket, Pierpol, Metallic, Savannah, Smalley Molasses, Joe Atian, and many blend into their communities. Many married whites. More importantly, they're still here, right here. Oxford County reported more than 200 Indians in the 2010 census, and Maine reported about 8,500 overall. Ooh, here he is. Waliwani, friend Peter, you have left me out. I am Natanas from Rokomiko, a long day's walk from Greenwood. When white men speak, much is not said. Your words are pleasing, you mean well. I will have my say now, please. Go ahead, Waliwani. Strong words will tell their own story. Rokomiko was our village. Our homes were there. We were farmers and hunters. Our life was tied to the earth, the seasons, and to each other. We planted much corn, beans, squash. We hunted caribou, deer, beaver, bear, and ate berry cake, grapes, nuts, nut bread, fish, and smelts. We used the brain oil from Magua, the bear, to tan our hides and mix its fat with spruce gum to mend our canoes. We were one with the land. We were happy when the Black Road Father Rail showed us Jesus Christ, as he had done with the Narantzawaks and the Amasakantis. My mother was Najewa the most beautiful woman of our village. She was kind and gentle like the deer of the woods. She soothed my brow in sickness, a loving mother. She helped me survive the cold winters of childhood. Her work was hard, but she never complained. My brother was Sabatis. I taught him the ways of the forest. We played on the river, learned our farming and our hunts together. Ooh, here we have Canton Point. This is where he's talking about. And just to orient you, at the bottom you can, is, is Canton, that would be behind you. And to the right would be Route 140 going to J. And to the left, down the Canton Point Road, 12 miles down, would be Dixfield. And what you see in that big uh, teardrop-shaped uh, alluvial floodplain are uh, cornfields. The same cornfields that the Rocomicos planted 400 years ago. They planted 600 acres and they traded their corn for other things that they needed. They did, 600 acres of corn. The, 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 the Rock Amicos in Canton Point are very special for two reasons. One, it's Oxford County, I like that. But two, the Androscoggin River is the only river in Maine where Indians dwelt that has waterfalls. So they have waterfalls in Brunswick, the soldiers and sailors come up to the falls and they go, eh, I don't think so. So the tribes above the falls are protected and the next one up is Lewiston. So you have the Amagon Pontooks. Uh, I don't think we're gonna get there, are we? So we, how are we gonna get those Anasagunacooks which are way up there? Well, it makes it very difficult to get the Anasagunacooks because of the waterfalls, the two sets of waterfalls on the river. So they lived kind of a charmed life and they were perhaps the least warlike of the tribes because they didn't have any natural enemies. They were protected by the waterfalls. That all changed, of course, as the, as the British got more sophisticated and brought more power to Maine for one purpose, and that's to control the Indians. They weren't doing this just in Maine. They were doing this in India. They were doing this in China. They were doing it all over the world. England was coloni coloni colonizing the world, and they better damn sure that they were going to get Maine. And as we all know, they did. Okay, my father Katonis visited the Penobscots and got a copper bracelet for Najiwa. They had traded for many like it with our friends the Montagnier, who were on the St. Lawrence River, and the Bayotuk of Labrador. 
where they had copper. We often traded our corn and beaver for white men's tools and guns. The French made sure we had guns to protect ourselves from the English. And to hunt food, by the way, because once guns came in, the Indians abandoned their bows and arrows. They saw how inefficient they were. And they wanted guns, and the English said, no, we give you guns, you'll kill us with them. So we're not going to give you guns. The French said, fine, you have to protect yourself, so we'll give you guns. It was an escalating time of madness. <clears throat> Long ago, my father Katonis and his brother Turumkin, our Sagamore, met Abenaki leaders from all over New England. They met in Brunswick, by the way. The talk was a, with war with the whites. They were like wild dogs, always wanting our land, our furs, our food, our rivers, our scalps. We never knew how many would come to cheat us, hunt us down, or give us their diseases, or betray us for bounties on our lives. Major Walden of Cochico, that's Dover, New Hampshire, helped the English round up 200 of us who had come to Cochico for safety. They took us back to Massachusetts. Some were hung or sold into slavery. We never forgave him for what he did to our brothers. We waited patiently for our chance to avenge their honor. We prefer death to dishonor. Thirteen years later, we had a revenge in 1689 during King William's War. Walden was the devil himself. He was warned to leave, but stayed. We burst into his home. We cut off his fingers and ears and stuffed them into his mouth. Maybe it was Cancomagus who scalped him and drove a torch into his eye. It popped like a chestnut. Major Walden was warned. He was warned by Indians who had turned traitor, and for a little bit of money, they said exactly what was going to happen to Major Waldron. And Major Waldron's response was, I know the Indians much better than any of you. I'll be okay. That's just what they wanted him to say. And here's a picture of uh, Major Waldron fighting off six Indians. And he really did trick the Indians into coming to Cochico, and they were sold off to sla in slavery or hung and they thought they were coming for some uh, protection. We took his sword and we pushed him against it. His gas were no more. The Pentecook cut off his head and hung it in the fort. Our trip to Cochico was indeed good. Our honor prevailed, but oh, the sweetness was all too brief. Time in England were against us. We were too weakened to resist you, too sick, too old. Memories of the good years were all I had to console me. Cold nights and howling winds lived outside my door. I would not live to see the end of the wars in 1760. Soon after, with France finally defeated and the black robes gone, your people began to move onto our sacred land. And here you are now. Our tribes may be gone, but our people are all around you. Here we are still. Whew, okay. Before the European contract, there were maybe 20,000 Indians in Maine. Nobody really knows, and everybody guesses. Nobody agrees on anything, so this is as good an estimate as anything. By 1617, maybe 15,000 had, had died of European diseases. That's 75% already. Then there were epidemics, 11 epidemics, in the next 120-some-odd uh, years. That wiped out a lot more. There was diphtheria, measles, and influenza outbreaks. So after the Revolutionary War, in which the Penobscots, by the way, under Chief Arnold, wrote a letter to Washington saying, we want to fight for you, and Washington wrote back and said, yes, we want you to fight for us. I'd love to have either one of those letters. There were maybe 1,000 left in Maine out of 20,000. So that's 95% mortality, gone. Oh, but here's the good news. First on the left, we have Sock Alexis Newell at his home on the shore of North Pond, a little eye candy for you. And on the right, just a little work I did a couple days ago on figuring out where the Indians were, and my eyes popped. 8,500 Indians in Maine, 4,950 in eastern Maine, and 3,550 in western Maine. Who knew? Who knew there were so many? It's like, wow, there's a political powerhouse waiting to be formed here. And I didn't write down the numbers for uh, Eastern Maine, but uh, Aroostook County, the big county at the top, there were 1,225. And in Washington County, the rightmost county, there were 1,609. And in the uh, Penobscot County, right under the O and the N, uh, 1,809. 
So the top three counties are all in the east, and the next five counties are in the west. 900 American Indians in Cumberland County. In my county, nearly 600. Over 600 in York County, down the, the bottom. And over 400 in Androscoggin County. I mean, I was astounded when I put this together. It was like, so I changed my presentation. It's like, well, hell, they're not gone, they're still here. And, and I wonder how that happened. So I think that's the next phase of my study is to figure out what happened because most of the tribes, all the historians will say, except for Colin Callaway and, oh, who's the other one? Day, Gordon Day, and a few others knew that they hadn't gone. And I knew they hadn't gone by reading all the cross-cultural uh, facts that I'd learned over the years, but I never expected this, 42% in Western Maine. All right, I talk, this is the man who got me onto the, into the Indian reservation on Indian Island. It was very, very difficult. I just simply called him up and said, hey, I want to meet with you. He said, Peter, come on up. He's 93 years old now, and when he was 91, he was telling me about his girlfriends in France. Yeah. Ooh. And just tell me, it didn't work out, Peter. Okay. All right. Well, he's, uh, he and his three brothers were drafted in World War II. You remember, they can't vote for president, but they can be drafted. Four brothers in the same family. He landed on D-Day at Omaha Beach, where he was a medic, and he saved countless lives. And he was a medic throughout the war and was captured by the Germans about six weeks before the end of the war. <clears throat> so he was a POW. In that time, he, he won four bronze stars, a silver medal. He was a Korean War veteran. And then, if this weren't enough, after he got done, he went to work for the International Atomic Energy Commission. And he would tell me about his adventures of driving around the president of Austria and the president of Germany in his taxi. And that he was one of the few people who could do it because of his security clearances. And he's just saying this over his beer, and it's like, and I'm saying, is this real? Am I talking to this guy? Wow. He's one of the men that I, men that I admire most in the world. And in 2007, Bunny McBride and her husband, Harold Prince, both ethnologists, worked with Charles to nominate him for the Chevalier de Légion d'Honneur, which was awarded by President Sarkozy of France in Washington at the French Embassy in 2007. So he's a knight. And it's like, and he's just as humble as he can be. He, none of this means anything to him. What means something to him is watering his wife's burial plot behind his house on Indian Island. Wally Wani, thank you. Greenwood Historical Society, thank you very much for your attention. This is Round Pond, by the way. This is another eye candy shot, Round Pond. And then just to give you some sources for tonight, you know, I'm very partial to the 1800s for my books, so. Uh, John S.C. Abbott, History of the State of Maine, second edition, first edition had too many errors in it. The Elwell corrected the second. James Finney Baxter, The Documentary History of the of State of Maine, volumes 23 and 24. That's a thousand pages of nothing but records of interactions between the Indians and the colonial governor of Massachusetts. A thousand pages. Who was at the meeting? Who signed the treaties? Who was the interpreter? What the issues were and what the resolution was. They're all in these two volumes. You'll learn more by reading 20 pages in that than, than you've learned tonight. Uh, and then Emma Coleman, the New England Captives Carried to Canada. Wonderful, wonderful book some real horror stories in there. She just did a great job pulling it together. And then Samuel Drake was Mr. Mr. Everyman's author on Indians back in the 1830s. He wrote countless books on Indians of America, all of them worth reading because he, he imparts so much more information than other authors. And he didn't have an ax to grind about a, an, a what, insignificant a point of study that Probably it's not all that controversial anyway. And then Charles Sturbord, uh, Indians of the Androscoggin Valley, uh, kind of a summary, cursory, breezy little book, um, but he gives some good information in it. And I think he gives some, uh, uh, some examples of Indian vocabulary. 
And John W. Thompson wrote a, an anthology, more or less, of the Rocamico, the Indians over in Canton Point, but it's nothing that's not available in other books. And William D. Williamson, The History of the State of Maine, 1832. Again, he, he's, he's rah-rah for the English, as a lot of these old-time authors were, but a lot of good information. Is that it? That's it. <clears throat> Thank you.